Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium. I know it seems like a strange combination, but that gives me a unique view of life and death. Death can be scary. I get that. That's why I'm doing this. I want to help people explore life, death, and what it all means. We are born and we die. What we do in the middle is the space between. Today on The Space Between, Tony Sicoria was a renowned orthopedic surgeon with a very busy practice who had no interest, time, or talent for music until he was tragically struck by lightning in 1994. The bolt was enough to kill him, but he was soon resuscitated after having a powerful near-death experience. Soon after his NDE, Dr. Sicoria developed a sudden craving for listening to classical piano, Chopin in particular. He began studying piano and soon developed a level of mastery that was astonishing. This led to his performing on stages across the world and recording several CDs of his original music, including notes from an accidental pianist and composer. He was profiled in neurologist Oliver Sacks's book, Musicophilia, Tastes of Music and the Brain. I also wanted to dedicate today's podcast to my uncle, Richie Sherman, who is also an orthopedic surgeon and a huge skeptic. So Tony, I'm hoping today maybe you can help him a little bit more come around to this notion of consciousness existing beyond our current bodies. So welcome to the show today. Thank you so much. So can you tell me a little, can you tell me what your life looked like before your near-death experience? Sure. Uh, Before the near-death experience, I was, um, first of all, I had started out as a scientist um, in basic sciences, and then I went into medicine after that. Um, So I I had a very strong basis in the hard sciences and their application into um, clinical systems as well. And I was doing a lot of publishing. I was the head of spine meetings. I was doing a lot of academic things. And and my life was going mostly toward an academic career and besides having a busy orthopedic practice. And I have always been a workaholic, but this really took over my life. And I would spend 12, 14 hours a day. And that was pretty normal. And did you did you ever have thoughts about what happened to us when we died? I mean, you operated on people all the time, right? You saw the inner workings of their body. Did you ever think about any of that? Marginally, it was it was never really a big part of my life. And so I didn't put a lot of thought into it mm-hmm. other than the fact that I was brought up as Catholic and I just assumed that that was the way it was. And when you died, then you, if you were, if you led a decent life, you might go to a good place. And if you didn't, you went someplace else. So what happened to you? I was at a family reunion in August of 1994. And during that time, we had five or six birthdays that were always in in August, so we would have a, a communal birthday party. And we were having it at Sleepy Hollow Lake, which is below Albany, New York, the capital of, of New York. Mm-hmm. And we were having a, a big picnic at this pavilion, which is next to the lake. And I was outside running the barbecue. I was not paying attention to the fact that the day weather had changed. It started out as a beautiful sunny day and somewhere in the midst of all of that, it got ugly and with menacing clouds, but I was completely oblivious to that. And my brother-in-law came around the building and I was going to 
have him cover the barbecue while I went and called my mom to check on her because she was not there. I walked around the front of the building to where the payphone was attached to the building, and I tried to dial her number. I let it ring for four or five, six times, and she never picked up. And as I went to take the phone away from my face, as it as I pulled it away, it was about six or seven inches away, and suddenly I heard this loud crack, and this huge flash of light came out of the phone and hit me in the face, and I knew exactly what had happened. I'd, I'd been hit by lightning, and it threw me back like a rag doll, and as I was flying backwards, it got very confusing because all of a sudden I was moving forwards, and and I thought, well, that's a really strange sensation because I was conscious of every millisecond of, of what had happened. And as I was thrown backwards, all of a sudden I was moving forwards and I was confused. And I'm standing there and I'm looking at the phone dangling and nothing is making any sense. And then I'm standing at the bottom of the stairs and I hear my mother-in-law screaming and she's running down the stairs toward me. And I thought, uh-oh, this can't be good. Your mother-in-law's <laughs> running at you screaming things are not good. And, but she was oblivious to me. And as she's coming down the stairs, I'm looking right at her. But she's not looking at me. She's looking off to her left. When she got to the bottom of the stairs, she ran right past me and and I thought, wow, what's going on? And I, I turned to see where she was going. And all of a sudden, I see myself on the ground. Oh, my God. I have the chills from head to toe right now. You know, it's about 10 feet away. And, and, and I thought to myself, you know, and, and forgive me for, for what I was thinking, but <laughs> what I said to myself was, oh, shit, I'm dead. <laughs> and, right. It was a it was a shock because there was no feeling of something having changed. The only thing I experienced in terms of feeling was that just slight sensation of moving forward, and I, I assumed that what that was was separating my spirit was separating from the body, uh -huh. and the body kept falling backwards, and I walked over to where everybody was gathering and it turned out that it was a, a nurse who was waiting to use the payphone after me. And she was standing there with her teenage daughter and I landed right at her feet and she was getting down to start CPR. And my mother-in-law was crying. And as I'm standing there, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that I'm still thinking exactly the way I would normally think. My consciousness was with me and I was completely aware of everything that was happening. I had memory of, of everything that I had been and had done. And I was, my mind was racing. And it became very clear to me at that moment that whoever I am, I always am. And mm -hmm. that carcass that's on the ground had nothing to do with who I am. And I realized at that time that my spirit continues on after the body dies. And as I'm standing there, it seemed I was, it was very dispassionate. I didn't have any emotion associated with all of this. So you weren't like looking at that body thinking like, oh man, you know, my, I'm, I'm missing that wedding next weekend. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that was the, the last thing on my mind was anything other than what I was experiencing at that second. Hmm. And I, I tried to call out to them and nobody could see me or hear me, but I could hear and see them. Mm hmm. And so I don't know why, but I, I turned to walk away. I thought, okay, there's no point in standing around here. And I started to walk toward the stairs because I wanted to go up to see where my family was. 
And as I started walking up the stairs and I'm looking down at the stairs because I, I habitually will look down so I don't trip and fall. And I got to about the third step and I noticed that my legs are starting to lose form. And I thought, whoa, this is really getting intense. And by the time I had gotten to the top of that first flight of stairs, I had lost all form and was just a ball of energy. And the stairs at that point go off to the left. And I didn't bother going up the rest of the way. I just went right through the wall because I knew my family was right on the other side of it. And as I went through the, through the wall, I was going through that room passing diagonally. And I, my wife was sitting on the couch and she was painting children's faces. And I made a specific mental note of, of where the kids were standing because that would be something that we would talk about afterwards and she would verify mm-hmm. for me that, yeah, that's exactly where these kids were standing. And as I got through the, that room and when I got outside of the building is when things really got interesting because it, it felt like I had fallen into a river of pure positive energy. It was a bluish white light. And as I was standing in it, it reminded me of when I was a kid swimming in crystal clear water where the sun was pouring down through it and it had a, a sparkly kind of appearance to it, but it was this bluish white light and there was absolutely nothing in it except if you can imagine absolute love and absolute peace. And as I stood there, and you just felt that it wasn't you, that you just felt filled with love and peace. Um, it was more than that. It was it was palpable. And mm. not only that, but as I started looking around, I could see that that energy or that force that I was feeling was something that ran through everything. I could actually see the lines of the energy traveling through everything that that you could normally see. And I realized at that point that this energy, which I, I called love, was what made up everything else in the universe that we see. And I became absolutely engrossed in this. And I'm, I'm, my mind is racing and I'm trying to, to add all of this up together. And as I, as I was standing there, I had the sensation that I wasn't just in one spot. I was moving. I had both speed and direction. And so I was going someplace, but I had no idea where I was going, but I could feel that. And right about the time that I, I was sensing that, I had a short video of almost a collage of high points and low points in my life, and then that was gone. And I was on whatever pathway I was on, I was ecstatic. I thought, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to somebody. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it was like somebody flipped a switch and bam, I was back on the ground in this body and it hurt like the bejesus. I had a, where the lightning had hit me in the face and where it went out my foot was like somebody took a hot poker and stuck it in both places and I remember thinking, I, I was really angry that, that I had to go back. Right. I didn't want to. And I, I literally begged not to have to go back, but was also kind of intuitively informed that it's not my decision. And at that point, I... So I'm, you felt like, because I've heard other people say they felt like they had a choice. You felt like you did not have a choice, like you were coming back. Yeah, I, I did. I really felt like it was not. It was not up to me. Okay. And at this point, I'm I'm stuck back in this body, and and I'm still unconscious. But I could feel that the woman had stopped CPR, and she was kneeling next to me. But I couldn't move, and I couldn't open my eyes. It seemed like for minutes, 
and finally when i when i could open my eyes and nothing was in focus and i finally managed to to look at her and and I, what i wanted to say was you know thank you for saving my life and sort of right yeah. well unfortunately the only thing that came out was i looked at her and i said it's okay i'm a doctor <laughs> and she just laughed and said, well you weren't a minute ago and at this point the police came and the, they wanted to take me by ambulance and i refused and i said you know what there's no point in sitting for an emergency room for 4 hours and for them to tell me i'm alive i know that and you know with lightning you're either alive or dead there's not much in between and I thought I'll just go home and I'll have my family doctors and my neurologist and everybody check things out and and make sure that it's okay and so that's what what happened I refused to go to the hospital and my family took me home So how long was like were you on this little journey um, my wife said it was 15 minutes How long did it feel like to you there was really no mm. sensation of time. It could have been hours, um, but it seemed like minutes. Okay. Because it was just, it was jam packed and, and things were happening at a furious rate. And my, the thoughts were, were at an equal rate. So it was, it was really, you know, there was no real sense of time other than the fact that, it was a continuous bombardment of information. And so what happened once you got back to your house and got back to life? Yeah, I, you know, after I went to the cardiologist and my neurologist friends and, and they said, well, you know, everything looks okay. You know, you're just lucky to be here. And so did you I, tell them about what you experienced at that I time? Didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't say much about it because at that point, the last thing I wanted to do was have somebody think that I was a lunatic. Right. I and, know the feeling, you know, in, in the, in the mid nineties, that was not a popular sort of stance to take. Mm -hmm. So I, I kept my mouth shut about a lot of the stuff for quite a while. You know, I told close friends and my family and that was about it. Mm -hmm. And and you confirmed it. You must have confirmed it with your wife that you were you saw her painting the kids faces and all of that. Yeah, I you know, I confirmed all of that with her. I confirmed, you know, what my mother-in-law saw with with her and, you know, and as time went on with with other people who were at the at the event so there was a you know there was a lot of of support for the fact that all these things really did happen it wasn't something i imagined and it, it took about a week almost 2 weeks for the fog to lift mm -hmm. and i say the fog it i felt normal except that you know, my head just felt clouded and I couldn't remember people's names and I couldn't remember the names of some other things, but yet I could function perfectly normally. Mm -hmm. Now, were and you back at work and? It, yeah, I took, I took that week off and by the time the week had passed, I was seemingly normal. And, you know, just struck by the fact that, okay, I, you know, I, I've, I've got enough science background to know probability and, and, you know, what's the chance that this could possibly happen. And, you know, I, and I thought a lot about it and I said, this was incredibly improbable, you know, to number one, get struck by lightning and then to to have the lightning hit a building that it lost some of its current. So it didn't turn me into a French fry. And then, uh. then to be sure that there was a nurse standing there in case things didn't go the way they were planned. Right. 
you know, so it, it was very clear to me that this was, was a very orchestrated of an event. And so I meaning orchestrated by something beyond your knowledge or control, but that it seemed like there were some synchronicities there. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to work and everything seemed normal until about two weeks afterwards. And I started to have this insatiable desire to hear classical piano music. And I thought, okay, this is pretty strange. My mother made me take piano lessons when I was seven years old. And I didn't want anything to do with it because it interfered with baseball and sports and fishing and all that sort of stuff. And so yeah, I did have to take lessons for a short period of time um, because that's what she said. Mm -hmm. And at that point I dropped it and never went back. And so for me to to want to hear classical piano was a big departure. I was a kid of the 60s. The only thing that really mattered was rock and roll. Right. And that's what I would listen to. And so this was, you know, it was a, a very clear difference. And so, oh. that, as that, you know, I, I started having that and, all of a sudden, I was like, I was compelled to go get some classical piano music. And there was, there was no, you know, I live in a small town in the middle of nowhere, and there's no classical piano music that you can even buy. So I drove to Albany, and when I went to a music store, a CD of Vladimir Ashkenazi, who was a famous pianist, playing his favorite Chopin just seemed to jump off of the shelf into my hands. And I listened to it nonstop. And it was very shortly after that, that I realized, okay, this is not going to be enough to just listen to this. I want to be able to play this music, but I did not have a piano and I didn't know how to play. So it was a, it was going to be a real daunting task. Uh, but at the at the time I had that thought that I needed to make that next step, the the next day one of our babysitters came by and said, I'm I'm moving, but I had this old upright piano. I was wondering if I could store it at your house for a year. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, talk about synchronicity here. Right. All of a sudden I've got, you know, I have the thought that I want to take piano to another level and the piano shows up. So I, I started, I bought some books on how to teach myself and I started trying to learn how to play the piano. And about three weeks after that, things really got interesting. And that's when I had a dream that was like an out of body experience. And in this dream, I was walking up behind myself and I'm at a concert hall and I'm playing music. And, and as I'm walking across the stage to, and I'm going to, my plan was to stand behind myself. And as I was approaching my, I'm not even sure what to call it. My other body. Um, I realized that the music that I'm playing is not someone else's. It's mine. And I thought, wow, I better listen to this. And as I was listening to the music and I'm standing behind myself, there was a, a loud ending to the music and it woke me up out of a sound sleep. And I looked at the clock and it's about 3.15. And I got up and I went out to the piano and I, I tried to plunk out some of the melodies of what I heard, but I had no idea how to write anything and I had no idea how to play. So I said, the hell with this, I'm going back to bed, which I did. But what was interesting from that moment on, whenever I sat down at the piano to try to teach myself or, or anything else, the piano music that I heard in the dream would start playing in my head. It was always the same. 
And, and it was almost like a, a two-year-old. It would become very insistent if I ignored it. And so I learned very quickly that, okay, I have to spend a certain amount of time on this every day. And, and that's what I did. And if I chose not to do that, it would become intrusive and start playing in my head when I was trying to do other things. Hmm. So I know that you're going to be going into more detail in all of this um, with the University of Heaven. And where do things sort of stand today with your piano playing? Because you're going to kind of take people through if they want to go and and listen to your webinar because you're doing a whole webinar with Dr. Raymond Moody, Kevin Fortune, who was on my show just last week about his musical ND, his near-death experience that enhanced his musical, his love of music and his ability to compose. But where are things today for you with this? Well, I, I just retired from my primary job as an orthopedic surgeon. And my next life as it is, is sort of right <laughs> is going to be music oriented i have besides the music from the dream i've had a lot of music that has been given to me and you know people have asked me well where is it coming from and and i wish i could tell anyone but it, it's the first piece was given to me in block form the entire thing was downloaded into my head and was exactly mm. the same whenever I heard it. And I have since had numerous other pieces where I have tuned into wherever the music comes from. And, and I'm not entirely sure where that is, mm -hmm. other than the fact that we know that on the right side of the brain in the amygdala area, Many people have suggested that this area may be some place that can connect with a greater unconscious, mm. and the music exists someplace. And the question, you know, is you know, is consciousness that something that goes across all dimensions and mm -hmm. all universes, and we are all part of it, and as such. Are we able to tie into things that we didn't realize we could? Or is it that we have genetic memory of everything we've ever done and everything we've ever been? And it's all in there, but we don't know how to access it. And I've had, I had numerous conversations with my friend Oliver Sachs before he died. And one of the things that we would talk about is, you know, where is this coming from? Mm -hmm. He had, his hypothesis was that the lightning took away some barriers in my brain to circuits that I was not supposed to have access to in this lifetime. And so it, it stripped away whatever barrier there was. And all of a sudden I have, access to parts of my brain that I didn't know existed. And when you take into consideration, we only use 10% of our brain that we know of, what's the other 90% doing? And, and that's a big, big question. And one of the things that I find very interesting is that I'm part of a group of people who have had They've been given the diagnosis of sudden savant, which is mm. out of out of nowhere they developed a, a talent that they didn't have before, and these are all people who either had a tumor removed, had been struck by lightning, have been hit in the head with some object. There's always been something that started the process, and all of a sudden they're abilities change where they, they can do things that they never dreamed that they could do. And, and I, you know, and I understand that and, and I've experienced it. So it's, it, it's very real. The, the question becomes, 
why can't everybody else do it? If, right. it, if it can happen to us, there must be a way to physically access it. To okay. get other people to access, be able to access it. Absolutely. And, right. I, and I truly believe that that we should be able to access those things. And it's just a matter of we don't know how. So we have to wrap up in just a minute. But what would be your sort of three takeaways for my listeners after your experience? Um, first of all is that consciousness survives death. Mm-hmm. We are, our consciousness is something that is part of our spiritual makeup and it is who we are and it is always who we are. And so that is one. And then the second thing was that we, the, the whole point of, of having a spirit and, and going through these lifetimes is to develop greater spiritual awareness so that at some point we can become one with the source. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that you just keep coming back and going through this until you have quote unquote earned enough points that you can go to the next level. And I think that that's how it works. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that, and then the the final thing is that there is truly a power much greater than anything we could ever imagine. And is God a person or is God a force? It is, nobody knows that, but Mm -hmm. I can tell that, the forces that I felt and and saw, I assume, are God, right. and and that force runs through everything, and is the consciousness of the universe. Well, this is such a fascinating story, and if people want to hear more about the music component of this, because we we didn't delve into that too deeply. You're going to be covering all of that on March 5th, which will, I think, be the day after we're airing this podcast. So Tuesday, March 5th, and people can go to the universityofheaven.com and sign up for the webinar, which will be fascinating, I'm sure, because you're going to talk more about the music and the music that you, that you sounds like channel right? Or that comes from somewhere within you, comes from somewhere we're not really sure of. Well, thank you so much for your time today. And if you're interested in learning more about Tony or his music, you can check out his music at CD Baby. And if you take a look in my show notes, I'll have a link to his email address. So if you have any questions or anything you want to follow up, ask him more about his music, you can go ahead and email him. Also, don't forget that tomorrow is the Dr. Raymond Moody University of Heaven webinar with Kevin Fortune, who was on the show last Thursday, and Dr. Tony, who will be talking more in depth about the music that they're currently channeling as a result of their near-death experiences. So go ahead and head over to universityofheaven.com, take a look at their webinar, maybe sign up, and we will see you on Thursday on Life, Death, and the Space Between.